Welcome to Sunday School Online. My name is Cassie Waits and I am the Associate Pastor for Discipleship at First Presbyterian Church of Marietta. I am so glad that you are here. We are living through a time of massive upheaval. The unemployment rate has hit an all-time high. The stock market is hitting record lows. 50% of our country have been asked to stay home and stay in. And just this week, our community declared a state of emergency. These are truly unprecedented times. But there is good news. As we face the chaos of this pandemic, Scripture assures us that where there is chaos, God is present. In fact, it is often the chaos that signals the presence of God. And so in the next few weeks, we are going to look at the times and places in Scripture where God draws near. In week one, we'll study theophanies. A theophany is the appearance of God to humankind. In week two, we'll dig into the concept of the day of the Lord. This was a day of judgment described by the prophets where the good would be rewarded and evil would be eradicated. And finally, on Easter Sunday, we'll move to the topic of the incarnation of Christ. We'll look at some examples where chaotic things follow Jesus around, and we'll notice that the gospel writers weren't afraid of these chaotic elements. They weren't afraid of the chaos. They saw it as evidence that Jesus was truly who he said he was, Emmanuel, God with us. In Scripture, where there is chaos there is God. And in our lives today, which are full of chaos, we know that God is at work. So grab your Bibles and let's get started. The word theophany is defined as a visible manifestation of God to humankind. And from the earliest chapters of our Bible, we read stories about God appearing to people. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we read, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. And in this very first mention, we have an image of God who walks beside us, with us. If we move forward to Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, we read now about how God appears to Abraham and how Abraham responds with reverence and with respect. And then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. We move forward to Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 3, and we read this. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. Then Abram fell on his face. Again, a sign of respect for being in the presence of God. But the appearances get even more dramatic when we get to Exodus chapter 3. This is chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. God called out to Moses from the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. Then God said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And so in these cases, we see people encountering God, and we at least know that there's some show of reverence that is happening. There are altars being built, people falling on their face in submission, uh, Moses removing his shoes, again, out of respect. But these appearances of, of God, these early appearances, uh, are nothing compared to what is to come. Let's see if you've been paying attention. It's time for a pop quiz. What is the definition of theophany? Is it A, the sound of God's voice heard by humankind, B, the visible appearance of God to humankind, or C, the study of the nature of God. If you guessed answer B, you would be correct. A theophany is the visible appearance of God to humankind. You might have been tempted to guess answer A, but in fact there isn't a special theological term for the sound of God's voice as heard by human ears. Usually what scripture tells us is that the sound of God's voice sounds like thunder. And if you guessed answer C, you're thinking about theology. Theology is the study of the nature of God. 
Now, one last point to make on this definition. You may be wondering about the word epiphany. An epiphany in the Greek means a near appearance, a near sighting. We tend to use the word epiphany when we're talking about Jesus' appearance to his disciples or to his followers. But when we use the word theophany, we're really referring to the appearance of God the Father to human beings. Moses leads the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt. They go into the wilderness. They come to Mount Sinai. And in Exodus chapter 19, they are on the threshold of receiving the Ten Commandments. But before they do, God appears to the Hebrew people and to Moses, to all of them gathered. And in Exodus chapter 19, verses, uh, verses 16 through 19, we read what that encounter was like. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke, because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, while the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak, and God would answer him in thunder. Here we have the overwhelming experience of being in the presence of God. And we notice a few characteristics of this passage, of this theophany. We notice that there is thunder and lightning. There is a cloud. There is a loud noise like a trumpet. There's fire. There's smoke. When Moses speaks to God, God answers, and it sounds like the roll of thunder. Exodus chapter 19 is what scholars call a classic theophany. God appears to humankind, and that appearance is dramatic, and it is terrifying. But Exodus 19 is not the only place where we get this kind of theophany or this kind of description of God. So let's take a look at some of those other places in our scripture. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4, Ezekiel speaks and says, As I looked, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually, and in the middle of the fire something like gleaming amber. And again, we have a wind, we have a cloud, and we have fire. In Job chapter 38, verse 1, Job encounters God, and we read, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And so here for Job, God appears as a storm. We also get a theophany in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, we read, Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. This is a description of the throne of God. Again, in Revelation eleven nineteen, we read, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Once again, we see lightning, thunder, earthquake, and storm accompany the presence of God. God doesn't just show up quietly in, in these theophanies. God shows up dramatically in a terrifying way. And that terrifying way includes all the elements. It includes thunder and lightning, earthquakes, noise, whirlwind, storms, and fire. One important caveat is that there are a multitude of ways that God appears to people in Scripture. Sometimes God appears as ordinary figures, as a person in a courtroom or as a warrior. Today we are focused on not those ordinary times, but on those extraordinary times, the times when God appears in dramatic and overwhelming fashion. The prophet Nahum also describes a theophany. Nahum's name means comforter in Hebrew, but Nahum was a prophet to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And you'll hear in these opening verses of Nahum chapter 1, you'll hear the description of God is this powerful, overwhelming force. The comfort comes for those who are faithful to God. Those who are faithful can trust in the power of God to deliver them and to save them from their enemies. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. 
The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. During the life of King David, we get a description of a theophany. This is actually in a song that David writes. It's not a direct encounter that David has with God, but we notice some similar elements to the other theophanies that we have read about in this in this song. And so here we have 2 Samuel chapter 22 verses 7 through 20. 2 Samuel 22 7 through 20. In my distress I called upon the Lord. To my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice and my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him a canopy, thick clouds, a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He reached from on high. He took me. He drew me out of the mighty waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They came upon me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. We notice a few elements of theophany here in David's song. We have, we have thunder, we have darkness, we have clouds, we have fire once again. And again, creation goes haywire in the presence of the Creator. As we read this passage from Nahum and from 2 Samuel chapter 22, we notice that God's transcendent power is a two-edged sword. For the enemies of God's people, this display of overwhelming strength, overwhelming power, is supposed to intimidate. It's intended to instill fear in the hearts of the enemies of Israel. But for the people who trust in God, for the people who are faithful to God, this display of power is intended to be a comfort. It is intended to be a comfort for people who have nowhere else to turn. They know that they can turn to God because in the face of their God, what enemy can stand? And so who do we have to be afraid of when we have God on our side? This is the comfort of these passages. And we notice at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 22, at the end of our reading, we notice how David praises God's deliverance. God drew him out of the mighty waters, out of those places of chaos, those places of despair, where we are overwhelmed, where we are afraid, and we, we think we have nowhere else to go. This is a song of faith in a God that is bigger than any of our problems and all of our challenges. Pop quiz. Which prophet did not experience God in earthquake, wind, or fire? Is it A, Isaiah, B, Ezekiel, or C, Elijah? If you answered C, you would be correct. Isaiah and Ezekiel both experienced theophanies of God that were extraordinary experiences, overwhelming, overpowering experiences of God's transcendence. Elijah experienced creation going haywire, but Elijah didn't actually find God in that chaos. Elijah found God beyond the chaos.
1 Kings 19, 11b to 13a. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. So what do we make of Elijah? Elijah's experience of theophany seems to refute all of these other examples that we've looked at through scripture. But this is what I would say. Elijah's story reminds us of something. When God draws near, creation goes haywire, of course. It goes into chaos. There are earthquakes and lightning and thunder and fire. And this was just understood to be signals that God was coming closer. But what Elijah's story teaches us is that the chaos is not God. God is not the chaos. The chaos may precede, the chaos may surround, the chaos might be an evidence of or a reflection that, that something dramatic, something big is happening in the world, but the chaos is not God. God is found by Elijah after the chaos. And I, I believe it's a, a sign of Elijah's wisdom, Elijah's deep and intimate knowledge of God that Elijah doesn't look for God in the fire or the earthquake or the storm, but waits knowing that these things are just signals of God's coming presence. And so as we face our lives today, full of chaos, full of uncertainty, might we do the same? Might we recognize that where there is chaos, God is drawing near and we know that underneath it, behind it, beyond the chaos, God is there. The scriptures we've read today point to a transcendent God, a God that is far beyond human comprehension. With this vision of a transcendent God, how are you putting your faith in God today? How are you trusting in God's power and God's providence? Thank you for joining Sunday School Online. We'll be back next week to study the day of the Lord. Thank you.